Marketing Officer at Speechmatics. And today we're going to be talking about AI bias, inclusion, and diversity in speech recognition. At Speechmatics, we focus on ensuring that every voice can be understood and building the technology required to enable other companies to embed artificial intelligence and machine learning into their products. Speech recognition is a non-trivial problem. It's difficult. We have technologies today that allow us to simply understand short commands with products like Alexa, Google, Siri, etc. But the complex dialogues that we have as people are very hard to transcribe and turn into pure text and to gain the value from those conversations. So this is a problem that the world has struggled with for some time to solve, and particularly it's struggled to solve it for diverse users. So users who don't speak in English that we would recognize as newsreader, TV English, that receive pronunciation English. So the range of voices that are out there is very complex and very wide. And that's the problem that we're working hard to solve. When we think about diversity, equity and inclusion, it's worthwhile defining the terms as to what we mean and what we mean in terms of AI and any AI bias in there. So from a diversity perspective, diversity in this context means the ways that people differ and how they talk differently. People might have an accent. They might come from a different country and be speaking a foreign language. For example, you might have somebody in India speaking English to an audience in the US and there's different accents being played there in different ways of speaking. You might have a younger person who's speaking or an older person. You might have somebody who comes from a less affluent background and has different modes of speech and ways of speaking. And you might have different types of language that are being used based around a more formal environment, such as a workplace environment, or the kind of language that you would use in more of a commercial environment or more of a street culture environment. So diversity really covers all the ways in which people differ around speech. Inclusion is how we build technologies that enable everybody to be able to use these technologies, regardless of your location, your accent, your social demographic background, the community that you're part of, etc., to ensure that the technologies work for everybody, which brings us to equity, where we say, look, everybody should gain fair treatment here. Everybody should have access to this, particularly in this new digital world we live in post COVID-19. Everybody needs to be able to use these technologies and have access to them, not just a limited, um, a limited few people who have privilege. So when we think about accuracy and when we think about how to measure accuracy, what's the traditional way that we would measure it? And the traditional way is inside the speech industry is we measure something called word error rate. So when we think about word error, error rate, we will take a piece of technology, a piece of AI technology, and we'll push somebody speaking some words through it. And then we'll measure the number of substitutions, deletions, and insertions required to get the precise transcript. And this gives the level of error that we see in that particular technology. And that error then typically is subtracted from 100% to give us a percentage accuracy number. So if we look at you know, typical accuracy scores, these are some of the accuracy scores that we see here across different languages, then we can measure different providers of speech technology. In this example, we're using Speechmatics, Microsoft, um, another cloud provider, and Google. And we're measuring those different percentage accuracy rates. This is what we would call narrow accuracy. By narrow accuracy, we mean this is a defined set of data that we're measuring in these different platforms to look at those percentage accuracies in there. Now for us, we've thought long and hard about how we broaden that accuracy definition and what journey we need to go on as an organization to build technology that will enable everybody to gain accuracy rather than just a narrow group of people who speak in a very particular way. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about that journey and, and what we've done. But to start off, it's worthwhile just thinking about what is bias. And bias really is how a preconceived notion of something starts to influence things that we do or things that we build. 
often in the technology world, the organization that is building the technology will have a defined set of people working there and their behavior, their background, their culture, their community will then influence the way that that technology is built. And an example of this would be, you know, if you've got a lot of engineering team members who are, you know, in their 20s, are highly educated, speak in a very articulate way, um, are quite privileged, then they will often build technologies that will work best for them and their community because they're building it and testing it. And we don't have a group of people from a less affluent background or from a much older background, for example, who may speak in a very different way. So this is how bias starts to affect AI. We're building something, we're bringing to the table the way that we do it as, as individuals. And then we're building the technology in our own image. So this journey that we need to go on has to be really, really focused around how do we take that personal bias out of the process of building the technology. And this is really, really important. The reasons being probably quite clear, you know, it's everybody deserves to be heard here. We have this immense unstructured data explosion that's going on out there. You know, social media, creative media online, streaming, etc., Internet of Things, big data and analytics, all this unstructured data, all of this video and audio content that's out there right now online. And we struggle to gain value from it and gain insight inside those, those unstructured files. We then have COVID-19, people working from home, video and audio being the new normal, and everybody needing to use these technologies. This, is, this kind of digital first explosion means that actually everybody is now involved in this. We've then got a new, a new generation of people coming in who are working in a much more consumerized Gen Z kind of way using media you know that always has subtitles on it you know consuming tons of TikTok and instagram videos uh, stories etc audiobooks being more commonplace so a whole range of different kind of ways that technology is being consumed and then of course we have a wider societal awareness of diversity equity and inclusion topics um, wider understanding of gender and actually recognition of different different types of gender identity, a real focus around inclusion and making sure that everybody's included in everything, looking at different kind of racial backgrounds, location, cultural accent backgrounds and socio demographics. So all of these play very much into how do we build technology that covers all of these things regardless of our own personal backgrounds. There's also a whole set of legislation that's starting to come through, and this is the European Union harmonized rules on artificial intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence act that's starting to look at amending certain European Union legislative acts. This examination of possible biases, looking at test data sets and the relevancy and representative, representative nature of those test sets is going to be really, really key for anyone building technology. I would encourage you to read up on um, particularly Article 10 in this new le proposed legislation that's coming through around data and data gov governance. So we've got an ethical requirement here and a cultural requirement to bring everybody in. Now everybody's online. And then we've also got a whole bunch of legislation coming down the path for us. So let's think, let's go back to the earlier conversation of why do models become bias? The core of this is selection bias. And, you know, one simple way of thinking about how you build speech recognition is you can think about audiobooks, you know, and there's amazing libraries of audiobooks out there, such as Audible, where you have somebody reading a book and then the words in the book are also available. So if you're building a speech recognition set of algorithms, you can take an audio book and you can look at the voice and you can look at the words that are in there. The challenge there though, is that society only has a very small number of people who are reading audio books and having them recorded and their voices are often very easy to understand and very clear. So we've got selection bias coming in here. A small number of people are reading these audio books then we're building technologies based around the way those people talk rather than building the technologies around the way society as a whole talks. And that's where this bias comes in. And this is the thing that we need to start to track down. And if you look at some of the larger data sets that are out there for um, 
text to speech research and speech to text research, the multilingual Libra speech data set is, is one such example. There are many different examples out there, but I use this just really to illustrate in this particular set of audio books here that is used to train some of the tools that, that are out there on the market for speech to text. Then we can see here that actually this data set contains 12,400 audio books in English with 4,000 speakers. German, there's only just under 600. By the time we get to Portuguese, there's only 68 books in there that are being done with 31 readers. And for us, the real important thing here is to say, look, we need to be able to pull in a wide range of voices, not just looking at 31 people reading Portuguese. We need thousands and potentially millions of voices to analyze, to build the correct high accuracy Portuguese recognition or Italian recognition, et cetera. So getting that data that's out there and understanding how that data can be used to build the right algorithms and deep neural nets is the way that we start to tackle this, this bias problem here and moving away from just a limited number of audiobooks. And as we start to think about the way voices work and voice accuracy works, we can think about a bell curve. And the bell curve that I've got here, the typical word error rate accuracy that you will see sits somewhere on that junction between quadrant two and quadrant three. And we can see that that's really the best accuracy that you get across this whole spectrum. Now, the voices that are in the, in the spectrum in our communities at large, in the world at large, go all the way from the far left to the far right. And as a speech to text company, we're very much focused on trying to map a curve that is as wide as possible rather than just a narrow curve that works very well for limited voices. So this really is the way that we are thinking now around word error rate, and we're moving away from this narrow word error rate to talk about a wider word error rate for communities. So what's the path to actually make this happen? We've been working very closely with a whole bunch of researchers. Um, Alison from Stanford has been doing some incredible work her, her, with her team there around looking at the fairness of speech to text systems given the potential to harm individuals by them being excluded. You know, and this ranges all the way from healthcare through to criminal justice. And I, I would encourage you to read up on some of the work that the Stanford team have done. It's really, really excellent. When we look at speech recognition, speech recognition is built around two key premises. It's built around creating what's known as a language model. And the language model really is all the words in this language and how they fit together. So. If I have 20 words in English and I know what those, those words are, I can then start to predict the next word that comes along. So that's one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is the acoustic model where we look at the fundamental phonetics. And this is where we get the types of speech that come through. So if you have a very strong accent, you will be speaking using slightly different phonetic structures and constructs than if you have a more received pronunciation accent. So we've got these two models, the acoustic model, which, ma which maps out the phonemes and the elemental structures of language, and then the words and how the words go together. And we need to map those two things together. And typically training data would be used to build these, these deep neural networks. And that training data would often come from things like audio books. And then when we're in the real world, we often have an awful lot of noise in there. So if you're trying to use real world data sets, it gets very difficult to kind of map it because of all the noise behind it, because it's not very clean data. And this is why we have challenges around articulation differences, speaking style, kind of regional non-native speakers, et cetera, accent, you know, different ways of speaking, vocal tract differences, maybe due to gender, due to gender identity, due to age, slower or faster speaking rates, Etc. So we've spoken about the simple use case, the command use case that we've had with Alexa or with Siri or with Google, um, where we're just asking a simple question or we're controlling something like lights. So that's a very simple control use case. You also see that sometimes in shopping systems, retail point of sale environments. The other more complex environments is where we're trying to extract meaning, metadata, keywords, summarization, sentiment, etc where we're looking to analyze and understand and do analytics, middle and big data work, and then really the long form transcription and interpretation of long 
conversations so that we can gain access to the meaning and the value inside of a conversation between two or multiple people. So these complex use cases require much more complex deep neural nets. And the traditional ASR that we have, as we've already described here, links together this acoustic model with these phonetic structures, with the language model, where we're looking at the static probability of a natural language structure. And a traditional ASR will take the words that you speak, will try and remove noise from it and look at what's called feature extraction to take the edges out of your, the tones that you're speaking and the noises that you're making and then tries to assemble them into phonemes and decode them against the language. And this works in a simple, simple kind of environment. But those other complex use cases, it works less well. And also, you know, we all see examples where, you know, things like Alexa, Siri, Google, etc. they don't work for certain accents. They may work less well for certain gender identities, etc. So we need to change the way this model, this traditional ASR model works. And that's the solution that we've built here at Speechmatics. So what we've done is we've moved from this old way of doing speech recognition, which was known as automatic speech recognition, to what we're calling autonomous speech recognition. And why we're using the word autonomous is that we are looking here at self-learning. So we're looking at how we can learn without bias how we can learn without bringing in selection of a subset of people and how it can start to self-learn. Now, there's a long journey on the table here for us to become completely autonomous, but we've taken those first steps for it. And really what we're looking at here is how we can start to use the internet and how we can pull information from sources such as internet radio, podcasts and the wide range of voices that are out there who are producing much smaller audio samples to create a much more comprehensive phonetic model and it's this phonetic model that is the key to the magic underlying all of this so how does this work in in practice and we're starting to drill down here under 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 the covers how it works is we, we work on a training model here to build these neural networks where we look at creating very, very large acoustic models with large and very wide ranging comprehensive phonetic structures from many different ways of speech. In parallel, we crawl the internet to figure out the language structure, the natural language structure for all the languages we're working on. And we do that far more regularly, rebuilding the language packs, rebuilding the phonetic structures on a monthly basis and moving over time towards weekly and daily rebuilds. So new words start to come through far, far faster. This training model that then gets configured into a customizable engine, because in some examples, we may wish to have something that runs phenomenally quickly. In other examples, it might need to be very, very accurate. Sometimes you want profanity to be in there in the subtitles, sometimes you want it removed. You know, an example might be, you know, for an Instagram video, you might be happy with profanity. For um, the TV news, you don't want profanity to show, for example. This configuration then gets deployed to any topology, so in the cloud, in your private cloud, on device, on edge, on premise, and then it's run to actually make this work depending upon the configuration. So that's kind of the, the construct that we work through. And to build those models, this is essentially the two sides of the structure we're working with here. On the left, we have these wide ranging internet audio sources. So we're training using self-supervised learning. And this really just means learning from first principles. It's listening to those sounds and producing an abstraction of every sound we can find from that internet audio that we're listening to and starting to create those elemental structures of phonetics and what and the sounds that make up those phonetics and we build a sound structure in abstract we also use then unsupervised learning to build a language structure that gives us this comprehensive ability to predict which word comes after another another word and then the label data that connects the two is a much much smaller data set so we've got this comprehensive acoustic model we've got a comprehensive language model we can then start to do adaptation to them if we're working in a special environment such as financial services or medical, et cetera. And then we add in extra features around these. 
including a front end to the whole piece that does things like remove noise, rebase accents and to tonality, look for initial acoustic uh, groupings and couplings and phonetic groupings and passes those down and acts as a coordinator across the different parts of this autonomous speech recognition engine here. So we're looking at who's saying what so that we can kind of say, the person A said this, person B said this. We're looking at which languages are used so that we can move between Spanish and English and German. We're looking at sentiment analysis, like, okay, is this person happy? Are they sad? We're looking at summarizing the meaning that's in there. And when this whole thing has worked through and the language comes out, we then post-process to do things like redaction of financial information that you might not wish to kind of hold, such as credit cards, removal of profanity, if you've set it up in that way, adding in brand terms, turning numbers from a long form, such as 2,556 into the numeric form, same with money, same with special character sets, same with brand terms, et cetera. So this really is our blueprint for autonomous speech recognition and how that will work in the future. And this is what we are building, and we've built a number of these components right now, and we're building out the rest on our roadmap. So we're trying to train for the future. We're trying to train for inclusion. So what's the kind of results that we're seeing right now? So remember, we're going out here onto the internet and we're listening to voices that are on the internet. We're not targeting specific voices. We're listening to all sounds that are out there from first principles. So the model and the machine doesn't recognize the difference between adults or children, people with particular accents or or particular backgrounds or, or from particular communities. But what we're seeing is we're seeing incredible uplifts in terms of comparative accuracy. And if we look at here at some of the different projects that we've been pulling uh, representative sample data from, uh, the Common Voice project is showing here that we're, when we look at children under 18 versus adults, this abstract self-learning approach is lifting us up to almost parity between children and adults. And we're currently tuning this to figure out how we bring it to exact parity. So on those data sets, our accuracy gaps are way below the market when we look at, look at the others that are out there, particularly you know, DeepGram, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, et cetera. So we're seeing a big uplift there in terms of that accuracy. And we're working very hard to lift both the adult voices and the children, children's voices up without targeting specifically the harvesting of children's data, which clearly is not a good thing to do. And then more interestingly, if we look at kind of the racial disparities, then again, coming back to Stanford's racial disparities in speech study, again, this is a different data set. So, so you get different accuracy results because it's on a different point on that bell curve. What we're seeing is that this approach that we've got of harvesting you know, accessible internet audio data to build these more complex acoustic models is giving us complete accuracy between them. So the two data sets we've used have been the Coral data set to represent African-American language, and then the Santa Barbara Corpus of Spoken American English to, to represent a much wider data set of, of US spoken word, and the also the Voices of California data set. And what we're seeing there is that we're lifting both the African-American voices up to the same level as the regular spoken American English data sets, which is, which is just awesome, and we're over the moon about this. So we're seeing great results from doing this, and we'd really, really love you to test this, give us some feedback, send us, send us your results, let, let, us, let us know what you're seeing, let us know if it's working for you. You can use this QR code to go and download a token to gain full access to this engine um, in the cloud and to start to actually upload files and work with that. So with that, I'll close the session and just summarize. Um, we believe we've made a huge breakthrough here with autonomous speech recognition. This is the step forward to actually remove our bias, to listen to the voices on the internet and to become wide and diverse in the way that we build those acoustic deep neural nets and that the, we can then recognize all voices, regardless of age, regardless of gender identity, regardless of location or community or accent or sociodemographic background. Um, and with that, I hope you test this out and thank you for listening. My name is David Keane and we're Speechmatics and I hope you come and test our product. Thank you very much.